Okay, we're back live at uh, Hortonworks Hadoop Summit 2012. This is theCUBE, SiliconAngle.com's uh, event coverage. We go out to the events, talk to the smartest people we can find, and try to see them from the noise. And uh, this show is about Hadoop. This is about the, the center of big data. It's a technical, focused engineering geek developer meets business ca use cases, not so much a developer mm -hmm. conference. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with uh, Jeff Kelly, my co-host for today, and uh, Todd Lipcon from Cloudera is on theCUBE again. Good to be here Alumni, again. you've been to me, we've number done a number <laughs> of times, five, six times we've had uh, um, Cloudera folks on, and just want to say to the folks out there, Cloudera, really the first company uh, to commercialize and be funded by venture capital, um, I think almost four years ago now, about four years ago? Yeah, a little less than four. A little yeah. less than, um, coming up on coming four up years. On um, really the first pioneers in, in Hadoop, the leader, clearly the market leader in today. Uh, Hortonworks, a, a number two coming fast up to Cloudera. A little bit different approaches, but uh, Todd, you guys are working well with those guys. Um, the big brouhaha, even a year ago, when Hortonworks kind of spun out of Yahoo, there's a lot of conversations, silly conversations around Cold War, who's contributing most, but for the most <laughs> part, um, it's been a really positive, Yeah, we like the know, word uh, cooperation. It's a peace, kind of a peace treaty because yeah. you guys all know each other, right? right yeah. And so the community's growing, um, real robust community in, in Apache. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of sees the big picture. Yeah. There's plenty of beachhead for everybody. Yeah. They all have coconut trees on them, you know, <laughs> a lot of fruit on the tree. Sure. Um, so I want you to share with the audience your view of this conference because um, we've been covering Strata, we're covering Hadoop World that you guys used to run. Now O'Reilly's going to pick that yeah, up yeah, we're the and take that off your shoulders, yeah. which is good for your company because you're not in the event business. But uh, um, you've seen the community grow yeah. from a kernel to now exploding. Yeah. Where these shows are selling out. Yeah, I think like, my first summit was, uh, this is my fourth summit this time. So four years ago, we were over in Sunnyvale. I think it was 300 people or 320 people. And now today we're 2,100, 2,200 people. Yeah, so amazing amount of tracks, a lot of yeah. interest. Yep. new entrance into the market, into the ecosystem, and the community, right? The coding yeah. community. So what's your vibe? Tell the folks out there what's happening at this show. Why is this mm -hmm. show different than the other ones? Uh, so I think as the event has gotten bigger, the amount of like business stuff that we see in the show has definitely expanded. Uh, like the first Hadoop Summit I went to was basically Hadoop developers talking about their recent projects. They'd added the Hadoop, like new features in Hadoop 0.18 or something like that. Um, now it's a lot more companies talking about what they're actually doing with Hadoop. Uh, new higher level frameworks people are building on Hadoop and new software that integrates with Hadoop. Uh, that's sort of the, the major shift in focus I've noticed. Certainly there's still some some talks about new features and from the core committers, uh, but of the six tracks, it's the only one of them is really like that, and the other five are more like data science, uh, mm -hmm. um, vendors talking about their some products. Some segmentation sort of, going yeah. on, right? Yeah, certainly, yeah. So uh, let's talk about, because you're an alpha alpha geek, as I, used to, as I say, but also a tech athlete, you've been on theCUBE a bunch of times. You've done a lot of work at HBase, it's well documented. We've talked about that, we'll get to that in a second. But HDFS is your new sweet spot. We talked at HBase conference about this. Yeah. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, um, a lot of discussion around the advancements, security. So I'd like to ask you specifically, what new features and developments are going on in HDFS specifically mm -hmm. that are helping you guys get faster, the near real time, and all the, the market demand? Yeah, so I actually gave a talk about this at HBase Con. So if viewers out there look on the HBase Con website, there's uh, slides and video from that. It was The talk was, uh, what has HDFS done for HBase lately, basically? <laughs> uh, so HBase is basically our real-time play, real-time uh, key value access, random access, very low latency. Um, and we've added a lot to HDFS in the last year or two for HBase in particular. Um, so I'd say the, the two key areas I'd focus on, one is performance, uh, just because you need this low latency, fast access. We've really improved the random read performance of, uh, of HDFS in particular, and just really reduced the CPU overhead for a lot of operations. Uh, so that's gotten between like a 2x and 4x measured performance improvement of HBase over the last couple of years running on HDFS. And then uh, high availability is the other really big one. It used to be that HDFS had a single point of failure, but in this name node master node, uh, if that node crashed, then the whole thing would kind of be down until you restarted it on a different node perhaps. You didn't lose any data, but if you're running a real-time website or something off this system, that's obviously a downtime that you didn't want to take. Right? How about robustness of, of HDFS? What areas are going on there? Well, we've actually always been very robust in the sense of um, we never lost data. There's very, very few documented cases of losing data on HDFS. All the ones I'm aware of have been either long since fixed bugs from like 2006 or um, like completely blatant administrator error where they accidentally delete everything on their node and they delete the backup or they never cook a backup, right? 
So can you talk about uh, security in HDFS? Mm -hmm. And also we just heard from um, uh, David from uh, Cloud, who ex Yahoo, who knows data. He's putting the analytic engines in HDFS mm -hmm. versus pulling that out. That's a big concern. So the security obviously is, is just a quick one. But then talk about the analytics side, because mm -hmm. that's where everyone wants yeah. The HBase is showing great use cases of storing as a store, mm -hmm. but getting it out of HBase is what everyone right. wants to do. Yeah, so on the security front, uh, so HDFS since about a year and a half ago has had Kerberos-based security. It integrates with Active Directory and all the enterprise-friendly stuff. Um, Cloudera Manager helps you set that up really easily and integrate with the enterprise systems. Uh, so that gives you basically access control to the data on HDFS. Uh, security in HBase, since it's another layer on top, is newer. Uh, that came in CDH4, which we released just last week in GA. Uh, so that allows you to, within a table, specify different uh, columns in that table and allow different users or groups access to those columns. Um, you know, distinct read or write access. Uh, so that's sort of the security thing. It's a newer feature uh, now available. Um, in CDH4? In CDH4, it's in the upstream uh, HBase 0.92 release. All of the CDH components, we build off the Apache open source. CDH mm -hmm. itself is 100% Apache 2 licensed as well. Um, so there's no secret sauce in our HBase. It's, it's yeah, the yeah. community's work and we contribute to it uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Um, analytic engine. On the analytic side, uh, I wouldn't say there's any new major feature on the open source side in HBase for analytics yet. There's a new feature called coprocessors, which allows you to essentially build extra code into the HBase servers themselves. You can think of it a little bit like stored procedures in a traditional database. Uh, so I don't think your average user is going to go out and write that's, a code That's not an open source, that's modifiable by. So this coprocessor framework is open source, and then you have to write, it's basically like plugins you can write. Yeah. And once you write one of these plugins, it sort of hooks into the core of HBase and can do you know, wildly varying things with just Java code, so you can do anything. So I don't think users are going to go out and write their coprocessors tomorrow, uh, but we're seeing companies like Weeby Data, for example, and Continuity, who are building their, their software on top of HBase, uh, and they want to be able to really hook into the core and do useful analytic things or um, you know, machine learning stuff inside the database itself. And I think they'll find this new coprocessors feature uh, pretty useful for that. We've seen interest from them. Awesome. So I anticipate users will be using it through another vendor or through another yeah. library, which is using these lower level components. Kind of abstracting that, that complexity yeah. away. And yeah. It'll be kind of under the covers. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, the high availability. I wanted to go back to that for a second because sure. you know, we, we hear a lot about single point of failure and it's you know, the, one of the key. We used to hear a lot of that. One of the key <laughs> issues, right. So can we put that to bed? Is I that, think we can is put that, it to bed, yeah. it, it, And explain a little bit about HA and how that works and, yeah. and how you approach that issue. And sure. again, is, is, it, is it a, Subject we won't be talking about anymore. It's I hope we're of. done with that. I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the last no, time I'll ask you. Hopefully. Great, great. Uh, yeah, so we built a basically active passive standby uh, system. So there are two name nodes. One of them is the active name node. It takes care of all the requests going through the namespace. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we have a single master like that is it really simplifies the system both for operations and for uh, the complexity of the code base rather than trying to distribute it. So it's been very, very robust. There's few bugs that cause any kind of issues. And then we have this standby master which is essentially keeping completely up to date with the whole namespace, mm -hmm. talking to the active master. And if the active master crashes, the standby can promote itself to become active within a matter of seconds. Uh, so there's no data unavailability. Any clients who are accessing the cluster will seamlessly fail over to the new uh, active master. And then of course you can repair your node, you can replace the RAM, whatever went wrong on it, replace the power supply, bring it back up, and fail back at your leisure whenever you, you need to. Just overall, I mean, that's a key component of being, you know, enterprise grade or enterprise mm -hmm. ready. Um, you know, where is Hadoop on that spectrum? Uh, is it safe for the enterprise, as they say? I mean, we have uh, about 50% of the Fortune 50 are using CDH in production, or not necessarily production, but in some sort of a serious project. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely is uh, enterprise happy in that sense. Like Fortune 50, how much more enterprise? <laughs> do you get, right, right, <laughs> right, right, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned security. So I mean, what are some of the other um, major issues we ha we have to tackle? In this from a community perspective uh, so I think forward. the ease of use is still um, an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, Hadoop was very much for the Java programmers out there who could sit down and write a bunch of Java code, write a MapReduce job, mm -hmm. understand for one, how do I take my algorithm and make it MapReduce, right. which is like not a trivial thing to do <laughs> for most people. Um, and then we saw you know, a couple years after MapReduce, we saw Hive and Pig come out, mm -hmm. and they made it easier for your average data scientist, um, sort of Python hacker kind of programmer, to put together SQL queries or Pig scripts much easier to consume, easier to write languages. Uh, and that really expanded the boundaries a lot. And I think the next wave that we've seen in the last year and continuing this year 
is more vendors building and then on top of these layers, mm -hmm. so you have like a nice point and click interface. So like Talend or Tableau or Pentaho, all of these different uh, business intelligence vendors and data visualization vendors mm -hmm. are now integrating as another layer on top. So that expands even now to the business users who never wrote a line of code in their life, mm, right. um, but they can get all the data that's stored in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. that's, let's talk about the application. The analytics side for a minute, because that again, when you outside, you go outside the little bubble of the kernel of the alpha geeks and the uh, mm -hmm. like yourself who are doing all the hardcore stuff in the mm -hmm. community. Everyone else on the business side wants the data out. They want analytics. They want real time, near real time. Right. Um, what what do you what can you share with the folks out there that you've learned in observations or anecdotes or examples that you can share with them as ways to do that? And let's take HBase in particular. So HBase mm -hmm. has become. As I said on Twitter last night, the holy trinity of big data, mm -hmm. HBase, HDFS, and MapReduce, those three things working together, mm -hmm. and we talked about this at HBaseCon, is, is, a, is a really nice configuration, yeah. kind of working together. Um, what advice do you give the people who say, hey, I love this, I'm going to put, I'm going to deploy with it, great batch collection, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll, we'll roll with the community on innovation, we're good for now, but what I need right now is analytics. Yeah. What do they do? I mean, is there a roadmap, like, is there like, Playbook? I think one of the mistakes I've seen some companies make is they go tool up instead of use case down. So they say like, oh, this HBase thing is really cool, or I've heard Storm is really great, and I want to use that, and they don't think about like what problem are they actually attempting to solve. Um, I think it's, people are much better success with Hadoop if they start with, here's a problem I have, here's some data I'm collecting, and I'd like to do more with it, and then talk to some experts in the community, talk to Cloudera, do some reading, um, take some training courses, and understand, okay, well, my problem, even though I think it's real time, actually a five minute batch, is good enough to be real time and actually it'll be 10 times cheaper for me. Uh, and make those sort of distinctions with the right engineering trade-offs once you understand the so problem. So take me through that. They're going to call Cloudera and say, we have a problem, call Cloudera. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's going to call you guys up, hey, call me up, and you guys yeah. will answer? I mean, uh, I mean so we're not a consulting easy? shop. We don't do like full beginning to end project consulting, uh, like some people do. Um, on the other hand, for a new customer, if we think there's a great Hadoop use case, uh, we do have some people who can go on site who are Hadoop experts and they've solved use cases like this before. I think our, our usual technique is we go in and we talk to the people proposing the use cases and we say, what are your 10 problems you think might be applicable? And we look at all of them and say, well, let's start here. This is one that we've seen be successful before. Uh, let's start with that, get you on the right path, find one really killer use case, and then expand to the 10 or 20 use cases you might have later. We were uh, calling we've seen H enough of them that we can, we were we can calling, pick out the good ones. We were right? calling HBase the tailored suit. Tailor it up for the use case. Yeah. If it's great, you try to do something else with it, it doesn't fit very well. Um, yeah. That being said, what would you say are the pros and cons of HBase right now? I mean, obviously, it's, yeah. it's booming, exploding, so there's a lot of validation, but from your perspective, pros and cons right now with HBase. So I think the pro is also its con. HBase is, it's not really a database, it's very, very close to the actual underlying disks and metal of the machine. Um, so the con of that is you have to understand, like, when I put data, how is that happening? Like, how does the write-ahead log work? How does that actually get recovered if there's a crash? How does it get laid out on disk in the indexing scheme? Um, so that sounds awful. You don't really want to understand yeah. how databases work. <laughs> That's to, big time plumbing. Right, but then the huge pro <laughs> is that when you actually understand all this stuff, you can write incredibly efficient it's applications. It's like assembly language. Very, very, yeah, it, it, I wouldn't go quite to the level of assembly language, but. It's like machine code. Yeah, it's, it's like code. machine code or like writing C. Yeah. And most people don't want to write against C. They want to write against a database or something. Um, maybe they're using C, but they're using higher level APIs. So that sounds like a big knock against HBase, but it also means that people can write applications on it. These people like Weeby Data, for example, or Continuity, um, or you know, shops that have a bigger engineering team, and they say, I need to build a search indexing pipeline. And I've got five engineers working on this, and we can take the month it takes to understand HBase in great detail, and then they get extreme power out and of it. And they get extreme, exact, that's yeah. the exact point. It's a huge investment and skill, yeah. but the upside's massive. The upside is huge. I mean, so so uh, talk about the innovations that are going to end, because obviously that's an opportunity for, when you have massive performance increases with HBase, and given how early it is, mm -hmm. this opportunity to abstract away the complexity. So you mentioned yeah. coprocessors. What else is coming around the corner to make that easy so that I could do it? So I think it's again, we're, we're waiting to see the next layer of libraries. So where MapReduce was four years ago, um, maybe HBase is where MapReduce was three years ago or something. There's some sort of... Uh, yeah. uh, early stage. Development, yeah, it's an early stage. We haven't seen a ton of libraries built on top of it yet. There's just maybe three or four I can think of. I mentioned um, Weeby Data as one of them. They basically built a higher level API where you can describe your business entities and a kind of schema on top of HBase. It maps it to these lower level constructs and gives you a REST API to put and get data. And then a simpler and they use job JSON API. as well. Yeah, it's all JSON. It's all very like friendly feeling to your average developer. You probably give up some of the power. Is uh, Weeby Data open source in those libraries? No, it's not open source, unfortunately. So it's proprietary. Yeah. Okay. But I think we'll probably see equivalent things in open source. Maybe not equivalent, but the same kind of idea. 
they'll Don't come forget out uh, VD, VDP Finders out there too, another stealth startup. Uh, it's got the libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our startup, by the right. way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's I don't a know. couple open source things on GitHub, <laughs> like Sam Kulara, whom you might know, used to be at Cloudera Labs as well, uh, built a thing called HAvroBase, which stores Avro objects on top of HBase. So they're these sort of like fledgling libraries that people throw Did around. Did Sam open source that? Yeah. That's He's on Twitter now, right? Yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so next up for you, what's on your agenda for this next year? Obviously, HGFS is good, but mm -hmm. what's on your roadmap? Share with the folks out there what you're working on, sure. and any kind of coordinates to get a hold of you to collaborate on code. Yeah, so right now, um, my major project is working on the next update of CDH4. So we finished the HA feature, we did automatic failover, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, currently, we have a dependency on an enterprise filer for that, which most of the enterprise customers we have are completely okay with. I think 90 or 95% of enterprise software does HA with a dependence on enterprise hardware like that. Uh, some of our customers, especially startups, people running on AWS or other cloud services, they don't have filers, they don't want to buy a filer. So the project I'm working on now is essentially a distributed system that takes the place of that filer and can redundantly yeah. store the, the state on multiple machines using a Paxos protocol. So as we discussed at HBaseCon, SiliconANGLE spun out a new company called VDP Finder, which we're doing some stuff on HBase, and uh, you met uh, our, our data scientist. Mm -hmm. um, it's challenging right now for to work on top of HBase, so like what we've found is um, it's great, but we need some more horsepower. So what is HBase going to come around the corner for uh, performance? Where do you see HBase going to the next level? If it was where MapReduce was a couple of years ago, what right. do you see happening with HBase? So in performance, uh, we actually have a new release that was recently released, 0.94, uh, which had some pretty big performance improvements over 0.92, which is the previous release. Uh, so we'll be pulling that into CDH very soon, I think. Um, and then I think it'll never be the same as a relational database where some people think about performance as in I can do a complex query and uh, it'll use indexes and stuff to find the right rows. HBase doesn't have indexes currently, maybe we'll get them eventually, but it's not really our sweet spot. Uh, we're more about the raw horsepower. So you do have to code a little closer to the metal to get that. Okay, so what about uh, MongoDB and some of these other databases? Where are they kind of shaking out into the ecosystem map in terms mm -hmm. of functionality? So are they finding a home? I think basically the contrast between MongoDB and HBase, if you want to make one distinguishing difference, is that MongoDB optimizes for features and is a pretty crappy database, like its internals are dismal. Whereas HBase is a pretty good database, but has very few features. <laughs> so depending on what your scale is, if you have very little scale and you want something you can get going super fast, Mongo is probably way better than HBase. But if you want to run on 100 nodes, there's not a single Mongo cluster in the world that's that big, right? And there are uh, upwards of 50 clusters I'm aware of that are over 100 nodes on HBase. Yeah. And, so. uh, and I was just want to give you a hat tip to Cloudera because, uh, like I mentioned, we run VDP Finder, our, our big data project that we've been running for our, our media business is now going to be spun out, a separate company. Uh, we use Cloudera Manager mm -hmm. and literally saved us six months of development time. Um, so thanks a lot for that, yeah. and uh, otherwise the free version. I'll pass version. the thanks to the other yeah, team. Yeah, I yeah. want the upgrade. <laughs> Tell Mike Olson I want the upgrade. Um, but I want to ask you about the, uh, the, that being said, you know, that's a real advantage for you guys, uh, and for like the Weeby Days of the world to have these libraries to accelerate the development process. So yeah. what has been the reaction of CDH4 with your customer base? You guys are talking to federal clients, financial, all the top verticals. What's yeah. been the feedback uh, with uh, CDH4? So we definitely had people trying out the early betas. Uh, Performance-wise, it's been great. We've had good feedback that it's significantly faster than the CDH3 versions they were using. Um, we've been competitive with other distributions out there that claim to be way faster, but we're actually neck and neck now, which is good. Um, in terms of the feature set, HA has been widely anticipated, so people are very happy about yeah. that. And the name node stuff? Yeah, the HA name node, yeah. So those are the two big, and MapReduce 2, right, was the big one? Yeah, MapReduce 2 is still early yet. I consider that kind of alpha beta quality at this point. So we made the decision a few months back that we would ship MapReduce 2 and give people the option of running that. But we are also continuing to ship the prior version of MapReduce, the stable version, MapReduce 1. Because um, many people wanted to upgrade to take advantage of the new name node and the performance improvements, but they didn't want a chance moving entirely to a new MapReduce framework. So I think that is the way forward. MapReduce 2 is the future. Um, but it's the future and not the <laughs> now and the yesterday. Uh, so some of our customers are more conservative there. Todd's the LeBron James of HTFS. He's a tech athlete. Um, thanks for coming on theCUBE again. <laughs> I don't, know if, you're, I don't know if you're Durant or <laughs> LeBron or uh, certainly not Kevin Garnett. He's going to be leaving the Celtics. Maybe Muggsy Bogues. Uh, kind of <laughs> um, final uh, question. Share with the audience how they get involved. I want to for the developers out there who want to code, mm -hmm. who want to get involved. You're a contributor yeah. uh, in the community. Uh, how they get involved. Um, so most developers are kind of shy. Share with them how to get involved and what to sure. do. I think the the best way to get involved is to find an itch to scratch. Um, 
So essentially, if you're using Hadoop already and you've seen an error message that you don't think is clear or you think the documentation is uh, vague in some area, uh, just fix something really simple, stupid first that won't have any like detailed design problems, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, the first thing you do shouldn't be like trying to add a major new feature. Just like learn how the process works, get the mechanics down. Uh, and once you've done that, then you can go from there really quickly to fixing big bugs or adding new features, et cetera. It's all in the open source. We do all of our development, um, co-develop with the community, all the design discussions that are out in the open, et cetera. Todd Lipcon here inside theCUBE sharing his knowledge. Uh, he's great, had on theCUBE. Uh, Brown alum. Yep. So put a plug in for Brown. <laughs> uh, computer science program, uh, great to have you on theCUBE. We'll be right back uh, with Arun Murthy, the co-founder of Hortonworks. Next, another uh, tech athlete. We'll be right back after this uh, short break. <laughs>